We are on Zoom, obviously. I know some of you are more familiar with Zoom than others. And so what we're going to ask you to do is keep your camera turned off and keep your mic turned off until we get to the question and answer part of our presentation. That way we won't be chewing up extra bandwidth and the videos will play smoothly and the presentation will go smoothly. So thank you for doing that. Um, at about the 7.35 mark, uh, we'll have a chance to get questions and answers um, from the audience. So at that point, we'll be turning cameras back on and you can participate. If you've got a question that you just can't hold back or you're afraid you're gonna forget, please go ahead and type your question into the chat. Michelle will be watching for those questions and we'll bring them up uh, at the end in the Q&A. Um, I recommend setting yourself on speaker view if you know how to do that. And that way you'll see the speaker and not all everyone's names and in your um, field of vision. Um, and I think that's it for housekeeping. So okay. I would like to uh, thank Mitchell Smith, who is our marketing and development manager here at 171 Arts Center um, for doing production, running production for us this evening. And I'd like to introduce, without further ado, Naila Ansari. So tonight we're bringing to you, there she is. Hi, Naila. <laughs> so we're bringing to you um, her choreography of Black Women Joy. We are thrilled at 171 Cedar Arts Center to be able to have Naila join us for what will be a multi-year dance residency, which we're starting out virtually, as you can see. Um, this dance residency is sponsored, co-sponsored by New York State Dance Force, that's a NISCA partner, and American Dance Asylum. And I am also going to call out Lois Welk, who heads up American Dance Asylum, because she <coughs> makes all the connections that have made this dance residency possible. And I'd like to thank our other sponsor, Courting Incorporated. So we're very excited to welcome you all here tonight. Um, but especially you, Naila. It's so great to have you here. Yay! Hey, Lois is right. <laughs> uh, um, thank you so much, Beth, and 171 Cedar Arts. I'm so excited to be here. And I first just want to open the space by thanking uh, my ancestors and the elders that are here on this call. I have to call a few people that I see. Ms. Robin, who was my teacher. Ms. Robin Hibbert is here. Um, Lois Welk, who really gave me um, the opportunity with the New York State Dance Force to really to develop um, this project and this work. I have my colleagues on this call, my partner, um, myself on this call. So I'm super uh, excited to be sharing this gift um, with you that I've received from my elders and Black women in my community here in Buffalo. So I just want to introduce you all to the project. That's me as a little girl, which uh, is something that I've deeply been working on in a process to redefining with joy and reimagining joy um, and spirit. So I'll take you through just a little presentation of what the work is and, and how I've come to understand joy and in, in the ways that it's kind of filtered into my life. Um, so the, the work at, in totality is called the movement of joy and looking and redefining, reimagining, seeing, defining what is joy, what's the, visibil what's the visibility of joy and how do we see that within ourselves. And for me, I was going through a really difficult um, time. I became a statistic, if you will, as a black single mother, I was having a difficult time in terms of being in an institution and having to deal with race relations. And there's some folks on this call that know more personal things about some of the work that I was trying to do on myself. And I got into a really space, a space of anger. And I had uh, my mentor, Travian Pollard, tell me, you know, what, what do you need right now? Because this space isn't healthy for you. And I said, joy. And it just came to me. I didn't understand what it was. And so it became something that I had to reach out to my elder, elders to define, which were Black women for me that I was always taught. That's who you go to to get the answers. And so it's really become a project where I've not only gathered joy for myself, but it's also joy in the community and joy in the stories of these Black women that have always had it um, in consistent ways, even though it necessarily hasn't been defined or explored. So through my research, I've come to find joy here. You'll see 
on the on the slide here, an ongoing practice aimed to match joy testimony, testimonials that meditate on remembering and understanding the movement histories that live in our physical bodies through movement, performance, film, writing, archival, archiving, and oral traditions. And that for me is something that is really important, um, understanding the ways that we archive our joy, because it's something that we often choreograph our trauma really well, but we don't tend to choreograph our joy. And so I've had this, this project going on now for three years and interviewing different women, engaging with different women and having conversations and movement performances, workshops, uh, community place making spaces for us to find joy. And I found through my interviews that joy lives in four spaces, play, resistance, community, and self. And in looking at play, it's really the space of imagination. And typically joy is the space of play that is most, is, is most captured by people. people are, it, it becomes a little bit easier for people to understand the concept of joy through play and imagination. So I had to go to a space for me as like, well, when do I remember really having play, right? People understand that in ways of uh, flirting, it could be games, it could be a multitude of ways. But for me, it was double Dutch. I remember going to New York City, my family's from Queens, and doing that motion of double Dutch. When I went back to it as an adult, I recognized the feelings that came back into my body, the memories that came into my body, the play, the imagination that came into my body and having the memory as a child of what that was like. And as, a, as an adult trying to see how do I find play? How do I find that imagination? And what is the joy in that? So in asking women and black women particularly about their joy, it did come in spaces of play. It came in meeting their husband in a club and came in at different times. Uh, you know, folks are again talking about double dutch or they talk about hopscotch, um, even play and just gardening. And so that was one of the spaces that folks took us to. And I call them rooms in terms of performance because I create these different rooms from spaces that the different women I've interviewed have come to, to talk to me about. So the next one is joy and resistance. And I say it as resilience because as black women we're often seen in our struggle and our trauma and our resistance, but we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily seen in, in the strength of the, of the resilience that it takes us to get through. And this woman here, someone dear to my heart is my mother's uh, best friend, uh, Dr. Rhonda A. Ricks. And she uh, was the first black female developer here in Buffalo, New York. And when I was doing the interviews, she um, had stage four lung cancer. And I did not know at the time um, that it had came back. And she knew that she was passing away. And she was the one person that said she didn't think that she found joy in totality. And she thought that joy was still looking for her and that it was in her resilience that she felt that joy was in her being. So that was something that I took to heart. And one thing that I was blessed to do that this was the last interview she had done. And I was able to give the interview of her speaking about her joy, her moving to her favorite song, which is part of the work as well and her dancing. And I was able to give it to her sons and her mother um, when she passed. The third room is joy and community, and I call it by way of Oz. And this is an interesting, um, this is an interesting notion to understand community because not all communities serve all of us all of the time, right? And so, how do you find joy in community without always having to out yourself? And I look at the Wizard of Oz, and this is a picture of uh, one of my art partners, uh, Marquis Ten Thousand Burton, who's a spoken word artist. And so often when we talk about joy and we talk about home, we, we often reference uh, and refer to The Wizard of Oz. And we typically refer to the, the, the film and sometimes the Broadway show. But what's interesting about that is Dorothy was able to find community and she never had to reveal her trauma, right? She lives with her and uncle. And at the, that time, particularly, there's, there's, there's something that have had to happen, right, with, with the parents, like where they're not there. No one ever really knows her story. But when she goes to Oz and she meets these people that are the other, which we would correlate in terms of American terms as Black folks, Brown folks, marginalized folks, and the others always have to talk about their character deficiencies, but Dorothy never has to. 
And so I wanted to look in terms of the ways that folks talked about community as, as a way of testimony, right? They saw themselves in each other and not, they didn't always have to explain or go into detail what their trauma was. They were able to see one another and able to see the joy in one another as opposed to their flaws or their pain or their trauma. And so this was the third room that I often look to in, in reference to Oz and, and recognizing how, how can we all in some ways collectively make each other feel like on our journey that we are helping one another to get home while also not necessarily having to always identify and choreograph the traumas um, on that path, on that journey. The last room is joy and self as time and responsibility. And this is a picture of uh, myself and my mother, Dr. Levon. And sorry, and it's really interesting because so often, particularly as black women, we don't necessarily always find the joy in ourselves because our time and responsibility go to other people. And that was one thing in terms of interviewing several different women on this project and on this journey, that the joy that they found in, in themselves was beautiful while also recognizing the responsibilities that they had to their community, but it was still in service to themselves. That was always something that came up pretty frequently. And in terms of looking at this in totality and looking at the project as a whole, these four rooms, in essence, when we are able to identify our joy consistently within the four rooms is when we find joy in totality. And that's in understanding the ways that we look at for me looking at the project and looking at the ways that we've interviewed black women. And this project really became because black women as my teachers, the ones that I was always taught to go to when I had pain and I had trauma and I had lessons that I needed to learn. And so it's really going back to the woman, to the black woman to be able to teach us these lessons about joy and more specifically to teach it about the histories and the movements that live in our bodies. So I just wanted to share a little bit of the background information and the research that I've been doing um, in terms of looking at what joy is and, and how do we look at it and also making a place to see it in a different way than ways that we've typically understood archiving and, and historical aspects <laughs> of collecting people's stories and what's the performance of it like how do we know how people have actually lived their lives and seeing the joy as opposed to the pain or, or you know standard written text if you will. And I'll open it up to, to Beth for some questions. Well, I have lots of questions for you. <laughs> yes. So you talk a lot about struggle and pain and finding the joy that is sometimes in the face of that struggle and pain. Sometimes it's from leaving the struggle and pain behind. What is your experience in terms of women actually giving, having to give themselves permission to feel joy or to express that joy? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Uh, I know in talking to, it, it, through this project, and I've talked to Ms. Robin a lot, who's on this call as well, um, about this. That every time I've interviewed someone, that question was not easy to answer. It did not roll off the tongue, if you will. There's a silence that happens, and in that silence, it's a reflection and it's a memory, and it's beautiful because you know you know that it's something inscribed in the body, but it becomes really complicated because it's not that easy. Right, and it should be something, right? And in terms of when we look at religious texts, when we look at spiritual texts, when we look at self-help books, it's something that we're, we hear pretty often in terms of what it is. And I've come to find it as a space of contentment, which is really difficult. Like that's like, like the highest peak of spirituality. And so often we think of joy as some a place that's supposed to give us like this, you know, we're elated all the time. And it really, it, it really lives in a lot of these places that we don't necessarily know how to discover it. And in this work, talking to these different women, it's, it's in the silence that I find the answer. It's not necessarily always in what they tell me. So that's really interesting. And as you, I, you know, we are going to do this project yeah. <laughs> here in Corning, New York. So the next step of this project is we are gonna be interviewing on May 20th, eight women from the Corning, Greater Corning and Elmira area who will be working with you talking about their joy, what brings them joy. But even sometimes it's difficult to pull that forward just through voice, just through speaking. Mm -hmm. So tell us how you're going to work with them through music and movement to bring those stories out. 
Yes. So one thing that I know about uh, Black folks, particularly Black women, is the, the social spaces that we live in, right? Like, it's not by era that when there's political chaos, there's also really joyous moments of social dance that happens. And so um, when we talk about the project, though, the ways in which I interview is not just pinpointed on these, these, these conversations or these questions about joy. It's, it's really looking at a deeper aspect and understanding how do you move your joy? Because one thing, and that's like, I'll quote a Martha Graham quote here, is like, your body never lies, right? What, what, what happens to you in the body when you hear that song? So I ask each woman to give them a song, to give me a song that gives them joy, and I play it for them. And, we, we, and however long it takes for them to get into that space, and then for, for me to see what that movement is, that really become, that becomes the archiving and performance of joy, right? It's not necessarily that your words aren't that, but what becomes what we can keep, what we can grasp onto is what, what we know to absolutely be true, which is the body. And the, 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 the picture that I showed of Dr. Rhonda Ricks who had passed away, the, the, the face that her sons had and her, and her mother when they saw her dancing in her joy. And she picked like Frankie Beverly Mays, like joy and pain, right? Like, and to, to, to have that be the last thing that they have, like to me, that's what this project is about. How do we create archives of people in their joy when we see them in their best light, as opposed to what we manufacturally tell folks or, or, or what we want people to know, right? How do we actually see them in their essence that most people don't usually get to see them in because they tend to be kind of private moments and so usually I kind of we do a little bit of coaching but not much is it's, it's really geared on what what really gives each woman each woman their joy and if you have trouble getting to that with someone what happens that's joy too and we and I've had that happen like I've, I've had women that are 90 something years old and they're like I don't I don't dance. <laughs> like, um, and the, uh, you'll see it in, in different highlights of, of um, different parts of, of the film and the work. Um, I had one woman who was actually Rhonda's mother, who was in her 90s. Um, mm -hmm. She just sat there and prayed. That's also movement. And I think that's, that, that is, is something that's interesting about the, pro the, the project, too, is so often we think we, we assume women, Black, Black women particularly, we assume their movement because mm -hmm. we assume what black folks typically, how they move, you know, for a lot of reasons. But one thing that's really interesting is that they don't ever really live in those stereotypes. And that's what's beautiful about it. Like when I show, there's a, there's a Spotify playlist that I've been keeping of everyone telling me their joy and I have like 80 songs on it now. And it literally spans, right? Like I had a, a black woman's like, I love Tennessee whiskey, right? It's like a country song because it reminded her of her grandfather in Tennessee. Right. And, and typically we would think that every black woman's going to pick a black gospel song. Right. <laughs> like, which is not the case. And that's and that's also another part of this project is that we see the humanness of these black women. We see who they are and their experiences, because all of our experiences are different. The complexities of blackness is different. The complexities of being a woman is different and our joy is different, but it's also the same. Right. And in certain ways, it brings us together, it brings our humanness together to, to see that. Right. Right. Well, and I'm wondering also, has your project changed because of the pandemic? And can you tell us a little bit about how the experience in Corning is going to be different from the example that we saw at the beginning of, of our program? Yes. Yeah, so um, in starting this project, it happened right before COVID hit. So I never was able to do a live performance of it. Everything had to go into this digital space. And uh, luckily, Lois and the New York State Grand <laughs> Dance Force, I got a grant to be able to function. So that was really where it started online, which it kind of shifted. And I was a little nervous. Like that was the process where I was like, can I actually make this go virtual? Like what has been in person and what the essence of who these people are have been so personal. Is this possible to create a community online? Is it possible to be able to put it into this digital space? And the answer is yes. Like the work that we did in that project online was incredible. And it's prepared me for Corning in a way because no, we're not necessarily sitting together in the group and having like dance parties that you all saw 
in in the film before. However, that doesn't negate the joy that people have brought in before whoever came in before them, right? And that's a sharing of songs. It becomes it becomes a party in certain ways because we have other people's joy playing in the background constantly. Like any song that you hear is what gave someone else joy. Right. And so there's a constant giving, receiving and sharing that has happened that I've been able to, to capture in the COVID-19 and this pandemic that I wasn't prior to because, you know, it's it's different. You don't get to necessarily talk in those types of, of ways and really understand and see people um, in their individuality. So that's what COVID has, has kind of done. It's allowed each woman to be seen in their individuality as opposed to a group. Right, seen and then you capture the story because you are, so you're coming to town, you're bringing a videographer and a producer. Can you talk a little bit about each one of them because they are creating those unique snippets from each of the women that you interview? Yes, yes, yes. So um, Mustafa Hussein, who's actually a corning, <laughs> former corning resident. He's uh, coming he's, home. <laughs> he's coming home. Yeah. Um, and he's also a New York Times photographer. So he will be um, capturing the film, the, the aspects of um, the work and the interviews and also taking portraits of the women dancing. So that's a, a, another part of the work is that we create uh, a book, if you will, and, and a portrait to, so to capture people in their movement of joy. And then Paulette Harris, um, who is a friend of mine, a uh, black woman who was helping to bring all the like the kind of the digital and the theater worlds together um so when we have the performance we're able to kind of to, to create the through line with the script um so what happens as part of this project is we actually create a story and a performance from these women telling their stories which is great and you mentioned the portraits yes so one of the things that we plan to do here here at 171 cedar art center is when you come back next year live after the pandemic we will have those portraits displayed here. Yes. I think it'll be really fun. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So pandemic again. So you are an assistant professor of theater and Africana studies at SUNY Buffalo State College. How much I've been on calls with you. I've gotten to meet your son and your cat and gotten to know some of your work. This is a real era of work-life integration. How has that influenced your project? Um, there's been a lot of moments where I've had to go back and reflect on my own joy because mm -hmm. you talk when you talk about it so much, or when you're you 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 often lose it sometimes. And so, particularly in a pandemic, nothing's easy. And mm -hmm. in in a in a way, it's been a blessing. It's also been slightly a curse in other ways right because you get so immersed in what you're doing that it's hard to see the joy because you see it you, you're, you're seeing it so much in other people that you're like I don't I'm not identifying that in myself right now and so a lot of it's been, become a practice mm -hmm. and so what I've done is take I, every single day every morning I get up I dance to the, the playlist um yeah, that's awesome yeah <laughs> so i've used that as a practice just to move sometimes it's on a trampoline um sometimes it's just moving but to to, to feel other people's joy to know that we're all going through this together right yeah. and that we can and we can make it together well and it feels almost as though you've lifted the joy to a new plateau because when you're losing your joy because your joy or finding others joy becomes your work i imagine at some level there's almost a comparative thing that you do yeah so by finding that movement in song that's bringing you back to your own joy then yeah it takes me to it's the reason why i started writing a book not because i love writing um <laughs> but because I, I needed to get more to the essence of what it's been for this country right because oh. we're dealing with two pandemics not just it's like not just the COVID 19 we're dealing with also trying to navigate black life in this in this country and what is and it does that even exist really in terms of like seeing the humanness in black folks and so that's been a lot and so i've i've really dug in deep in 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 in, in my writing um as a part of the movie because i don't i don't have the space all the time to just go to the studio and interact with people and, and just like let's just do this process and so i've used the choreography to to write in the ways that i've choreographed my my movement I've, I've said okay 
what what has happened historically in other periods of time that black women have champions right and then there's i just did an interview with a wonderful woman named michelle gibson who actively is keeping the legacy of of new orleans second line and she's a grand marshal and and having those interviews with these women that are keeping a legacy through so much pain and trauma that black folks have had to live in in, in very different eras for me, this is like my legacy. Yeah, so you're and, building a legacy and it's your legacy, but it's also, you're capturing the legacy of every single woman who participates in your project. Right, because for me, I, this project, when I the way I got into archiving was from a woman named Dr. Ama E. Garten Kooten, um, who is now, she's a senior VP of creative affairs at Warner, Warner Brothers, but she's been working on a show called At Buffalo um, that was, you know, set for Broadway. She's done TED Talks, all kinds of things. And she really focuses on the archiving of Black performance. And it was looking at the Pan Am here in Buffalo. So mm -hmm. that we met when I was doing graduate work. And to look up, I was looking at Mary Talbert specifically for my research assistant. There was nothing there about her. So we're trying to like write a script about this woman that we know was incredible, but the essence of who she was and her spirit, we could, we, we, you're like guessing, right? Based on all of like court documents or legal doc or whatever it is that really don't show most people in their best light. And um, that made me say, how, how can I, how can I archive the essence and the joy of the black woman that has really been a teacher for all of us in this country. And that was that was really the start of understanding it from an archival perspective, because I really had only known it from like a really white male dominated space. <laughs> so I was never interested yeah. before. <laughs> so it wasn't until I met Dr. Alma that I was like, oh, wow, you can like archive performance outside of just like a VHS or a DVD and, 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 the, and the deep work that that comes in, into play. So that, that was really kind of the impetus of, of wanting to collect these stories and be able to share it. And so the next part of this work, the more stories that we get is for people to be able to upload themselves and really create a, a database of, of joy. Which is fantastic. And oddly enough, you and I have talked about this a little before, the pandemic created a space mm -hmm. that allowed you to spend some time to process, to create. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit more? Yes, I would. Uh, if the pandemic did not happen, I don't necessarily know that I would have been as gun ho <laughs> about this project. <laughs> because it's, it becomes really easy when you don't have, when you don't have hardship, right? Like, you know, my, my mom always says, um, with every our hardship comes ease. And, you know, for, for me, the, the pandemic made me focus differently because it was because I was noticing that people didn't have joy right. and that it was really difficult, particularly my students here, like they're dealing with a lot of depression. And I didn't really know how to capture that until I started bringing these practices in the classroom. Like we do joy check ins every day, like drop a one if you're feeling joy today, drop a two of your, you know, and they do it and they it makes them feel that they they have a space to even identify just to even think for that day every single day i ask what gives you joy and i ask my son every day he's five what gave you yep. joy today well that's what so we <laughs> to go around the dinner table yes. what is your great right, what is your rose and what is your thorn so it's the balance of both but sometimes it's that thorn that makes the joy so much sweeter yes unfortunately right so, and then yeah. that and that doesn't go away like life is hard and I think that sometimes that bothers me. Sometimes I have to read a lot of help, self-help books for this work that I'm doing in, in spiritual books and religious books. And at times it's, it's difficult because that hardship gets so quickly brushed over. You know, it's like, oh, well, let's just, you know, just just think about this. And like, and, and like the, the power of affirmation and manifesting is real, but it's also recognizing that within that, we also have to be able to go through that journey and be clear that that journey can also bring us joy. Right, right. So I know we need to get to the audience's questions too. And I've seen a couple of things about like, go Naila, capturing <laughs> those stories and doing the archiving and, and just really creating that legacy. It's a wonderful thing. What can our Corning audience expect from this project? We talked a little bit about you'll be back. You'll be here in person on May 20th, capturing these stories. 
And then we're going to bring you back again in Zoom on Zoom in July. So what can our audience expect? So in July, you all will be participating a little bit more with us. Um, in July, we'll be gathering the songs from the audience that give them joy. Um, and we'll also have my uh, our partner, Ten, Mark Keys, 10,000 Burton, who will do, we, we, we work a lot off of improvisation of joy um, in the practice that we kind of developed through the New York State Dance Force um, grant. And folks drop words that give them joy. And we use that to create performances um, and, uh, and bring people into the space as well. So we it will be interactive um, and there will be a, a little performance for you all in July. <laughs> so, and we're really looking forward to that. I can't wait. And then, as I mentioned before, you will be back next year, timing to be announced to do what you usually do or what you intended to do when you started this project, which is for you to dance live, Talk about your interpretation when you go live. What does that look like? Um, right now, we're actually working with um, Isadora software. So we're working with uh, a lot of projection mapping and bringing the stories in the film that we are capturing from the interviews to life. So that in a lot of ways, the women are kind of telling their own stories and then creating the movement. So I, I typically take the movement from each woman and create choreography based on that. So the, the work is always is always based on the women that I've interviewed before and then what I've learned coming out of it and the ways that we create it as, as artists. So there's the other dancers and artists that are, in, that are involved to really show through the body what other people's joy looks like and how we've been able to navigate the joy through their stories. Right, and so there's an opportunity that we've talked about for inviting some other corny artists to participate in that. So yes. stay tuned, there will be more. We're not even sure it, I mean, that's developing, so we can't even tell you exactly what it's going to be. goal know it's gonna be great, right? Yes, the goal for the project is anywhere that we go, we always invite the community in, right? Exactly. We don't like to go anywhere, we don't are not invited. Because <laughs> that's also about the, about the work too, to make sure that we, we, we work together as a collective. The, whole, the work is about a collective and it's about sharing the joy and, be, and to be able to archive in whatever city, wherever place we're in, that archive stays with you all as well. And so to see artists that are from your space to be able to create joy, to hopefully create, continue the legacy. Exactly, and as a community arts center, that means so much to us yeah. in our service to the community, truly. Yeah. So. I would really, I hear Sia, Naila is wonderful. Thank you for all you do for the community. Hashtag legacy. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea. Um, I think it's time to take some questions from our audience. So I'm going to go on mute. And Mitchell, did you want to field audience questions? Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Um, so you can either uh, put your uh, question in our chat or if you would like, you can even uh, turn your camera and mic on and ask a question directly. Um, let's see, we have, um, uh, we have Louise Richardson saying once again, thank you uh, to black women for showing us the way. I'm so excited about this project. Thank you, Naila and Lois and 171. Um, before that, we had uh, Melissa, uh, Mel <coughs> Melissa, Ruffin, who said, so excited for the voice your work will amplify in our community. Um, we do have a question from Gail, um, from Gail Beatty, who says, is this project a lifelong effort or is there a beginning and end? My goal is for it to be lifelong. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that it can live in archives and, and be a constant collection for everyone to see. You know, I think the one thing that um, the passing of Rhonda, cause she's the first person that has actually passed so far when I, since starting this project, that I, that is, is, is interesting because joy is one of the only emotions that can happen simultaneously with another emotion. And that look on her family's face, I can't imagine not doing this project, for, at least for the rest of my life. I hope that someone else can take it from me and you know, keep it going. <laughs> um, but we, um, I have been in talks here with uh, Buffalo State College and the Archive that they've have they've started to archive um, the work here. So even the performances will be doing it. Yes, that's the goal, Gail. Got documentary, please. If anyone, <laughs> that is the goal. Yes, yes, yes. All right. 
Um, any other questions from the audience? So I have, so I, I do have a question. Um, as you're archiving this, is, where's the goal for people to be able to see this and experience this? Where is this going to live eventually? What is the hope for that? So right now it's at uh, Buffalo State College. We're working on building a collection so, so that it can be um, on, a, on a virtual database that people can just add to it. Um, because you know, with performance, it's ephemeral. So the, also part of the project is that it's it's not just text, right? Like the, the goal is for people eventually, what we would love to do is to have an app that or a QR code that people can take and they can show themselves dancing and saying their joy. And then we can take that and then just, you know, just can, can keep it as a virtual kind of um, database in, in, a, in a virtual collection. So right now it is housed at SUNY Buffalo State College. We're working on developing the collection there. Great. Um, and then uh, Gail also asked, uh, where are you going next? Uh, I'm going into Corny <laughs> and then uh, Michigan Tech University um, also reached out, which was like, you know, a little shock. I was not prepared for that, but they saw the work from the New York State Dance Corps. So thank you, Lois. <laughs> and they're like, this is amazing. How do you, how do we do that? How do we do this here? So we just got a call um, from them to bring the, the project there to do a performance live so this is this is really just wonderful because we did not expect this I did not like starting the project it was just something that I needed um to hear just from my elders to help me get through and performance was the only way that I knew to do it I didn't think that anyone would necessarily really care so so Lois was one of the first people that were like this is a good project You're like you need to keep this going because I sometimes you just don't really you, you don't know what you don't know. And so, uh, yeah, so that's where we're going next after Courtney. Great. Um, uh, we have uh, say some more about how you find joy in, in our down moments. Yeah, um, it's a lot of different ways. I've found that it's a practice. Um, for me, it, I am a mover. So for me, it's been through the, the physical, um, aspect of, of myself like again like every morning I'm not kidding when I say every morning I, I get a song and I just move to it and I just need that from myself um I know it's been interpreted from other folks that have been in part of the project um a lot of people write and they've just like they're just they just creatively write um but the easiest thing that I can say in in this project is to just ask yourself is this moment giving me joy and there's sometimes where like, it's like, I, I think I've told Beth this, like I've been on a meeting and I'm like, this is not giving me, I tell my, like, I've like trained my like colleagues up, like this is not giving me joy today. So like, I need to, <laughs> I need to remove myself. And sometimes it's really just the act of saying no, right? And, and a lot of it is also the yes and too. Um, and sometimes no is the yes and. Like, yes, I, I'm doing this and yes, I have to get through this kind of difficult time but I also have the choice to choose joy and that joy can also be resilience. And I think that is something that I don't think that we talk enough about that when you are having a down moment, where do you find the joy in that? And, and to act, the, the problem is we don't actively ask ourselves that. And I think that the more that we get into a practice of asking, then the, the easier it is in those down moments. Yeah, be protective of your space is, and, and you gotta teach people. I, I've always said this, the worst, and I think sometimes the most disrespectful thing that happens in relationships, and no matter what the relationship is, is when someone says, this gives me joy and you actively go against it, right? And then like a, an example would, some, would be like, you know, someone says, I really love reading. And you said, well, I hate reading, <laughs> right? There may, be a, there may be a time where you say, you know what? I really wanna spend more time with you. Right. And so often it's the ways that we phrase things and the ways that we use things that can hurt people because they've actively shared what their joy is. And when we say we dislike what that is, then it, it creates, it really creates a friction. And that's what happens a lot in relationships, not just relationships with spouses, but relationships at work, relationships across, across the board, even with children, right? Like you can, you can say to your colleague, you know, it does not give me joy to write a lot of emails. 
So when someone just forces you to write a lot of emails, it's like almost like they actively, <laughs> right? As opposed to saying, okay, so what, what works for you? And I think just that language and, and, and Gail's right about protecting your space, sometimes is, it's also the reminder that we have to say things differently. How long is the youngest lady that you, there was? Yeah, so the youngest one I've had so far has been, she's in the film, has been 14. Um, so we are working on making this intergenerational. And this is also not just a project for Black women. It's, I just wanted initially to start the project as Black women be in the forefront of it because so often they're left behind. Um, but this is a, a project that is to expand intergenerationally, also between race, class, gender, sexuality as well. Um, there was a second part to that question oh, yeah. too. Do, do young people have a better... Uh, express themselves better about they joy. Sure or? Do. <laughs> they do. They the, the the two young women I had with the with the older women in the in the group. They were just going off, and it's so funny because it's like those things that you teach your children. You don't know that necessarily know that they're grasping onto, but they're like, yeah, no one should take away your joy, and like this gives me joy. And they're so profound in what they're saying, and it's those moments that I do want to research a little bit more. Is like when do we lose that confidence of knowing what joy is? Right, like when, like at what point in time? Because it is different than other emotions. Is like when do we lose that aspect of ourselves where we have to, where we have to look for it again? I think it might come with that time and responsibility. You were talking. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Usually, right? <laughs> um, is there a pathway between your work with joy and yes? Um, I think. The Black Lives Matter movement has been a movement since the inception of this country. <laughs> I know it's not new. And I think that in, in terms of understanding as a joy, I think that Black joy is a phrase that's used a lot right now. I don't necessarily know that it's been defined very well. I don't know that it can be defined. I, I know it as infinite possibilities. And so the pathway that I see, particularly when I look at performance and when I look at Black performers and, and, and what those spaces are, it is infinite possibilities. Right, we can't live in a box. We can't live in a bubble to tell us who we are and how we should identify. And that's the joy that no matter what is happening, I'm going to creatively find my way through. I'm going to creatively define who I am. And if you try to take it from me, I'm going to redefine it again. And that for me, as, as, a, as a, in a connection to Black Lives Matter, I think it's a connection to all movements that have championed change and progress, which is, is, which is really for an artist, the best artists are ones that constantly create possibilities. Great. Um, so that was our last question. Um, we did have. I was to say, I've got, I've got one more. It's yeah, sort of, yeah. Okay. So we've already talked about all the great things that, that you're working on now, but you're also a 2020 Western New York. Um, state Choreographers Initiative um, recipient, and you have work going on with Ujima Theater. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the rest of you and what you've got going on next? Yeah, so, so I, um, I'm the dance director for Ujima Theater, so we've been really doing a lot of uh, progress and change because our founder, uh, Lorna C. Hill, uh, passed away um, this summer, which is really difficult for us and so we've been really trying to build and, and, and really push the stories um, as best we can in the virtual space. So our goal right now with Ujima is to really build and, and create the dance um, collective and to build it through storytelling and the ways of really like capturing dance theater, uh, which sometimes I feel like doesn't get enough, doesn't get enough oomph in the, in the arts. Um, but yeah, um, I'm finishing writing this book and, and also just, it, also just creating choreography. I'm in a residency right now with the UB Arts Collaboratory um, for a month with uh, uh, my art partner, Marquise 10,000 Burton, working on uh, choreography and movement for, for the performance um, and, and really working with the projection mapping as well. That's exciting, really exciting. So Mitchell, I think we have one more question and then I think we're gonna wrap up with a video, another video that Naila had. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, it looks like uh, E. Monsell wrote, this is an, al an al analysis and a question. I break the word enjoyment down to the meaning of the joy within, in, inside, joy, journey of our 
why and meant meaning. What would you say your why is in terms of uh, your own practice and this project? Yeah, I know Monsell. Monsell's doing this to be, actually, he's a dancer too, y'all, so, <laughs> and a scholar. <laughs> um, <laughs> so my why, you, you know, you always got to prepare for the one. Uh, <laughs> it's a disruption. I think our joy is a disruption in, in, in the institutions that we live in, in the ways that we have to exist in the world. We are not used to seeing people's joy or validating their joy. And the why is, for me, is why not? Why, why not? show our joy? Why not be a disruption to like the, the mediocrity and the trauma and the pain and the sorrow? Why not just be able to say, I'm feeling really joyful today? That's the why is that we, that we choreograph our joy more than we choreograph our pain. And that, that for me is if I can get that as a notion in our mind and not just always physically, but in our mental space, am I choreographing a story right now on my body, in my body and through my mouth that is of trauma and pain or am I choreographing it through joy? And that is my why and that has also been my practice that I have to reiterate to myself every single day because it is very easy, particularly in terms of the body. When you ask someone to feel, you know, can you show me what depression feels like? Can you show me what sadness feels like? Can you show, it's a, it's a lot easier for people to do that than when you say, can you show me the joy in your body? And for me, I want everyone to be able to say yes. Lovely. <laughs> why not why joy? Not joy. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag, why not joy? <laughs> well, great. Um, I, thank you so much again for bringing this project to Corning, um, especially to Lois here up in the top. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start this last video we have to share and make sure I actually hit um, share with sound this time. Um, <laughs> and... So I want to thank everyone for coming and Nyla for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, here we go. Finding joy, you have to learn how to love yourself and learn how to properly love other people, elevate from the negativity and being degraded and just stay with people who are close to you and who truly love you and know how to love properly and love themselves properly because that's important. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like if you surround yourself with the right people and have love for yourself, then happiness isn't the word. You found joy, you found peace, mm -hmm. and love. When did you discover joy? Listening to my mother describe my birth and the birth of my children. That's when I really and truly knew joy. I think I really discovered joy when I turned 50, which is like nine years ago. And my children were, born, um, were all grown and I decided that I was just going to, um, I was gonna move myself to the forefront. Joy discovered me when I met my husband. Um, it was at a nightclub, eventually. <laughs> It's so many things, emotions that you can find in reading, so there's joy in all of that. I find joy on the stage, any capacity. I understand joy is just being me mm -hmm. and recognizing how much I have to offer and feeling connection, you know, and you don't always have to outwardly express it. It's always, it's an internal thing, it's a personal thing. People may not see it on the outside, but as long as you feel it on the inside. It ain't never been this dark while watching all of the lights dimming. Amazing what the mind forgets, but the body remembers. I trade in my trauma for a moment of tender. I'd give it all again, I'd give it all again, I'd give it all again and touch like a woman. Amazing what the mind forgets, but the body remembers. I know that there's hope to be had. Joy to me is when you just are in alignment with yourself. And whenever you are that, you're connected to everything else. Expressing myself, whether it's through my words or my feelings or my creativity, or just, again, connecting with people's energy and just, just meeting someone new and being open to opportunities. That's joy for me. Amazing what the mind forgets, but the 
nobody remembers. I traded my trauma for a moment of tender. I'd give it all again. I'd give it all again. I'd give it all again to be touched like a woman. I've always heard people say, oh, are you happy? Or she's so happy. But I rarely ever heard anyone speak about joy. Um, and so one element that I really want to look at in this uh, research is, is this something that we can pass on to our, our children, um, to our daughters, as a way of, of speaking it into existence. Thank you. And thank you everyone again for coming. Really appreciate it. Naila, thank you for your time and all the work we've done together. And I'm looking forward to the project and everything you're going to be doing. Lois, thanks again for the connection. Ooh. Mitchell, thanks for being our Zoom. Thank you. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Everybody you. for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you much. Thank you. I'm so excited to hopefully see you all and next year for you all to see the performance. It will be fantastic. And some of the, the clips that you saw in there because of COVID, we didn't get to do the full, but those were rehearsal clips that we had um, in the space with different artists creating some stories. Right. Well, good night, we'll be reading more information about when we'll be back. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Hey, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Hi, Leila. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>